Hello, everybody. Uh, this is Brother Luke, Sin City Preacher. Uh, welcome to this episode of Bible Talk with Brother Luke. Uh, this is episode number 20 in our study on the subject of heaven. Uh, if you haven't seen the first 19 episodes, uh, they're available on my YouTube channel, Sin City Preacher. I hope you'll go back and watch it from the beginning. Uh, this is a very thorough, comprehensive, and joyful study on heaven. We're using this book by Randy Alcorn titled Heaven as kind of a, a guide. We're going through the book and discussing it. Uh, so uh, I have Brother Eric with me now. I want to say hi to everybody. Introduce yourself. Hey, everybody. Uh, Jesus Knight 72 here. Uh, happy to be here as always, and uh, happy to be here for a milestone episode again, 20, 20th episode. <laughs> 20 episode. And, you know, if people understand that each episode is two hours long, so <laughs> at the end of today, uh, this will be 40 hours. Yeah, the whole week. work week. <laughs> yeah. Could you imagine, like, That's how many fun. topics... Uh, can you study for 40 hours? And we still haven't exhausted it. There's still a lot to go. Uh, I mentioned this last time that after today, we're going to get into answering some some of the real common questions that people wonder about. Of like, what about my pet that I love? You know, will will right. will my will I have my pet in heaven, or or will we have uh, will be eating food, or will we get married, or and all these. Kind of what age will we be? Where our bodies be? These kinds of practical questions that everybody's curious about. Uh, we'll be getting into that beginning next time. Uh, but it's uh, it, it is not only uh, a vast subject, which is a surprising thing, because if you were to ask a typical Christian to tell you what they know about heaven, <laughs> it would probably take them maybe. 15 or 30 seconds. Well, I think that's one of the things that's most surprising for people, I think, if they check out the episodes. And really, if they if they see that they're that long and they don't watch them, you're really selling yourself short because, first off, each episode, for everybody out there, each episode's broken down to there's various questions we're answering. So even if you want to skip forward or, or go to videos that have certain questions on certain topics that you're interested in, you can jump to that video and try to jump to the part in that video where we're kind of talking about that question. So you can kind of do it piecemeal you know, kind of go, you know, question by question, jumping around. Um, but, yeah, like you said, there's there's so much information, really, and we're even, in going through the study, we keep coming up with things. We're like, wow, I never kind of thought of that before. That's something, I, it never occurred to me before, and the discussion's really kind of opening up a lot. And the biggest thing, like you said, it's a very, it's a very um, uh, spirit-filling uh, uh, episode. It's a topic. It really, it really builds you up a lot. It gives you a lot to look forward to. Yeah, um, theology as a whole is, is, is just fascinating, and uh, um, most of my life I've kind of specialized in the in the part of theology called soteriology, and that's mm -hmm. the the study of salvation. Right. And that, that's my main focus is trying to tell people how it, what what they need to know and what they need to do so that they can actually go to heaven. Right. Um, so that's been my focus, but. Uh, now people, once they understand heaven, they can get excited and say, "Yeah, that sounds good. I really do want to go there. What do I have to do so I can go to heaven?" So we're gonna. Well, that's that's a good thing. It's like a continuation of your soteriology. We should we should entitle these things. Okay, I'm in heaven now. What? <laughs> say, what what's gonna happen now? What what should I expect? And hopefully. You know, hopefully we're using the scripture for this. Uh, I think Randy does a really good job of really um, spelling out his resources in the scripture very well, answering the questions very well, and his use of, use of scripture is um, is you know for the most for the most part you know pretty on. I mean, I agree with uh, with most of what he says. Yeah. Okay. Um, let me see where we left off. Okay, we're uh, just going to pick up at chapter twenty six in his book. I don't know if it's page like 253 in yours, but in my book, my edition of it is two, page 253. So the question we're at right now is, oh, by the way, if, if, if this is the first time you're watching one of these videos on heaven, Randy has an interesting style of writing in this book where each chapter is uh, titled with a, as a question. And then throughout the chapter, there are follow-up questions. And so I really like that. Uh, format because 
these are kind of the questions that sometimes we think of, and, the, and sometimes we think, well, I never thought about that, but I would like to know an answer to this. And the title of this chapter is, Will There Be Space and Time in Heaven? So he says, a number of books suggest that our existence in heaven will be without space or time. One book describes heaven as a mode of existence where space and time are meaningless concepts. But is that true? Uh, have you ever heard that uh, point of view from people? Yeah, actually. Um, that's been a question I've had because I've heard multiple opinions on that idea. And I was kind of always of the perception of once we move into um, – in the millennium, definitely space and time will still be an issue. We know time will be passing. We know a millennium of time will be passing a thousand years. So clearly time is still monitored at that point. But when we transition into eternity, I think the question arises – and it's a good question – is um, does time really apply anymore? Because we as human beings see time as something that really shows our mortality. So once we're immortal, does time even really mean anything to us anymore? Well, once once we're going to live forever, um, will the passing of time really be relevant anymore? Yeah, yeah. It's uh, plus just the whole concept of time for me uh, is just a, a, like a mind-boggling, brain pretzel twisting concept. Uh, I always get just really all confused trying to understand. The, the concept of time. I mean, when we think of just past, present, and future, but I've watched some sci-fi movies that deal with time, and and uh, it just it can be really, really, really amazing uh, uh, and confusing to me. So, you know, with my our finite minds, our limited intelligence, you know, for us to understand that time is, I think, a problem in itself. Um, he says, "What will the new celestial heavens be like?" What does the Bible mean by the term new heavens? Uh, let's look at a few passages. The Old Testament uses no single word for universe or cosmos. When Genesis 1-1 speaks of God's uh, creating the heavens and the earth, the words are synonymous with what we mean by universe. Heavens refers to the realms above the earth. That's the atmosphere, the sun, the moon, and stars, and all that's in outer space. Then in Isaiah, God says, Behold, I will create new heavens and a new earth. Uh, this corresponds to Genesis 1.1, indicating a complete renewal of the same physical universe God first created. Uh, I, I think it's, uh, he, he makes an important uh, point that uh, uh, the word heaven in the Bible and heavens mm -hmm. is uh, a word that I think is, is most people have no idea of what it really means. And of course, uh, I understand that there are basically three heavens in the Bible. Mm -hmm. And uh, you've got the, the heavens, which is the whole universe. That's what he's referred to here. And then on other takes in the, in, in, in the scriptures, it talks about the heavens just as being the area right around the earth, the, kind of the earth's atmosphere. Right, right. right. That's, where, that's where the birds fly and, and right. things. That's the heavens. Uh, and then you've got another use of the word heaven, which is right now we know that God has a throne and it has a physical location someplace, uh, either in the universe or in a dimension, but it's a physical location for the throne of God. Right. And that is, that's called, uh, uh, that's the heaven that a lot of people think of when they hear the word heaven, they think that's where God's throne is, that's where God is. Mm -hmm. Have you understood it in that sense? Yes, that before? Yeah, that, that, that's exactly as I see it. And that can be really important in which heavens you differentiate when you're reading in Scripture, which heavens it's talking about. Because some, there is some confusion there for people, and I think it causes some big problems in how they understand why things work. In Genesis, there's kind of a – in the beginning, there's kind of a, um, a, a base description of – uh, working our way from outside the earth down to the earth in in the words of the heavens and the earth it's kind of it's kind of a way to working from from the outside in to this small place that we call the earth from the immensity of the whole universe as we know it so it's kind of a you know the stars the moon the sun, and then we know there are other stars and galaxies and systems out there so 
it, the, using the term in that way is the heavens uh, as a whole is the best way you could put it re really I think in all of those cases is anything that's not the confines of the actual earth part of earth. So it's anything outside of what is the earth part of earth. It's anything above it. So you've got the atmosphere on its way all out through the rest of the universe. Yeah. Uh, but then, of course, we have to realize that the Earth itself is is uh, exists in, within this heaven. Right. Correct. Have, the Earth is part of the heavens. Right. One of, you know, who knows? An unlimited number of um, mind-boggling number of planets and stars and solar systems. Uh, okay. Revelation 21 says, uh, "I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away." I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God. Because, quote, new heaven is singular, um, uh, uh, it is used here, some think it's God's dwelling place that passes away and is renewed. But the present heaven is described as unshakable in ways the physical universe isn't. That's in Hebrews chapter 12. Could you look up that up? Hebrews 12, sure. 26 through 28. Okay. And it says, um, starting at verse 26, Whose voice then shook the earth, but now he hath promised, saying, Yet once more I shake not the earth only, but also heaven. And this word, yet once more, signifieth the removing of those things that are shaken, as of things that are made, that those things which cannot be shaken may remain. Wherefore, we, receive, we receiving a kingdom which cannot be moved, let us have grace, whereby we may serve God acceptably with reverence and godly fear. So he talks about shaking the earth and the heaven. Okay. Uh, all right. So, uh, in other words, he's saying that some people will take Re Revelation 21 as as that God's dwelling place, this throne of God, uh, is going to be rebuilt. But uh, we know that this is taught. We're going to, as we go on, we'll see this is not talking about that particular heaven. It's talking about the universe and the earth. Right. Um. Uh, the new heaven in Revelation 21 apparently refers to exactly the same atmospheric and celestial heavens as, quote, heavens, unquote, does in Genesis 1.1. It also corresponds to the new, new heavens of Isaiah 65, um, Isaiah 66, and 2 Peter uh, chapter 3. In Revelation 21, we see God's dwelling place isn't replaced but relocated when the new Jerusalem is brought down to the new earth. Um, we've we talked about some of this in previous episodes too about this new new heavens, the new earth, this, how it's going to all be. Uh, basically, it'll be destroyed, but and then renewed. And mm -hmm. we, we I don't know if we've really concluded whether it's going to how much to what extent it's going to be destroyed, where it no longer exists, or it's going to be destroyed to the extent where it's just going to be remade and and uh, uh, without the curse, the universe, whole universe is suffering under the curse. Uh, so you've got uh, uh, the heavens being and the earth being destroyed, and then the new heavens and the new earth, and you have God's dwelling place, which is called the New Jerusalem, comes down and actually comes to the earth, and God's uh, capital city, New Jerusalem, is on the earth. The new heavens will surely be superior to the old heavens, which themselves are filled with untold billions of stars and perhaps trillions of planets. God's light casts the shadows we know as stars. Uh, the lesser lights that point to God's substance. As the source is greater than the tributary, God, the light, is infinitely greater than those little light bearers we know as stars. The Bible's final two chapters make clear that every aspect of the new creation will be greater than the old, just as the present Jerusalem isn't nearly as great as the new Jerusalem. No part of the present creation, including the earth and the celestial heavens, is as great as it will be 
in the new creation. Well, I mean, not only do we get this from the scriptures, but it's just something I think everybody uh, thinks is that in this, in the state of existence, even if a person hasn't been following along the study and they just think that heaven is some uh, like dimension, uh, mm -hmm. non-physical, ethereal dimension of existence, they think of it as being perfect and pure and better than the existence we have now. But but now we know that no, we're going to have the earth as it is now but made better and we're going to have our bodies as we know them now but made better and everything is going to be made better than it is uh, that it has been in the past. Hmm. Um, while some passages suggest that the universe will wear out and the stars will be destroyed, others indicate that the stars will exist forever. Uh, Psalm 148. Um, is this a contradiction? No. We too will be destroyed by death, yet we will last forever. The earth will be destroyed in God's judgment, yet it will last forever. In exactly the same way, the stars will be destroyed, yet they will last forever. Based on the redemptive work of Christ, God will resurrect them. That's kind of an interesting picture because, you know, we think a lot about that moment in time where God's holy city leaves the dimension that it's currently in and comes to our dimension and becomes one with the creation. And, you know, you think about that, and that's a, a major event unlike anything that's ever happened in the history ever. I mean, before creation started. It's just, it's a major, major event. And you wonder how that thing is going to affect all of creation. You know, I mean, it might be that we, we concentrate so much on the earth changing at that moment that the earth is going to become very different and yet same. And, and uh, the heavenly city is going to come down. When that actually happens and sin is destroyed, we might have a pretty spectacular light show. I mean, this might be something that we see the effects, like a ripple effect going through all the heavens, affecting the stars and the things that we, you know, will we be able to see things in the heavens that we can't see now? You know, will the heavens suddenly pop with the brightness that they never had before? Will they, will they, you know, I mean, it really gives way to the imagination to think, wow, I wonder how, you know, could we, could we maybe be gearing up for the most spectacular fireworks display we've ever seen? <laughs> mm hmm Yeah. <laughs> Well, uh, we didn't get. We were not there for uh, God's original creation, but the new creation. Uh, it would be pretty exciting to be able to witness that, wouldn't it? Oh, absolutely! I'm very curious. Yes, because we know we are going to be resurrected, eternal beings, uh, before this. Uh, the, the the heavens and earth are destroyed, and then and then um, recreated. We, we will exist, so uh, will we get to watch that? that, that that's a, a past... Uh, what could be more exciting than, than actually witnessing a new creation or, or well, a recreation? That's a, great, that's a great point, and the thing that's interesting to me about it is we know that when man fell, that one huge catastrophic event not only affected us, but the ripple effect of that affected all of creation. These major events affect all of creation in big ways. You know, um, when the Messiah came and was born on earth, you know, they, we, we speak of the star that was seen in the heavens and things that happened. You know, it seems like when these, when these major events happen, major things happen too. And, I mean, it's really like when we're, for instance, when we're changed, when we're resurrected, um, is something major, is that going to affect things, you know, when we're, when we're changed and we're resurrected? I mean, you, you begin to wonder these things because every time these major things happen, there's sort of a ripple effect from these major events. So you, you wonder how one's going to affect all the other things. Mm -hmm. I've never really thought about it until this moment that uh, we will have an opportunity to watch this, uh, the heavens and earth be destroyed and then resurrected. 
Uh, Earth is the domain of mankind's stewardship, but it is not the only domain. Because the whole universe fell under mankind's sin, we can conclude that the whole universe was intended to be under mankind's dominion. If so, then the entire new universe will be ours to travel to, inhabit, and rule to God's glory. We talked about this a little bit in the past too, but that's a, that's another really exciting uh, you know possibility. Uh, and, and if if you're watching this now and you're saying, well, we're we're coming to a lot of conclusions that are not clearly stated in the scriptures, uh, you're right, and we're speculating about a lot of things. We're not we're not. I did not just say, "Thus saith the Lord," you know, uh, but. Um, I think that you can uh, take from scriptures some things are explicit that it's just it's it, that's what it says and then other things we we kind of piece it together and just try to draw conclusions and and uh, infer from it uh, uh, see see what it's implying to us and come to these conclusions and it's speculative and it's fun and it's interesting I think we're supposed to do this we're supposed to think about these things but it, uh, we're not preaching this as some kind of dogma. Yeah. All right. Uh, do I seriously believe the new heavens will include new galaxies, planets, moons, white dwarf stars, neutron stars, black holes, and quasars? Yes. The fact that they are part of the first universe and that God called them very good, uh, at least in their original forms, means they will be part of the resurrected universe. When I look at the Horsehead Nebula and ask myself what it's like there, I think that one day I'll know. Just as I believe this self-same body, as the Westminster Confession puts it, will be raised and the self-same Earth will be raised. Uh, I believe the self-same Horsehead Nebula will be raised. Why? Because it is part of the present heavens and therefore will be raised as part of the new heavens. Well, you know, when you think about the bodily resurrection, you know, uh, I used to worry about uh, uh, being buried and, and having my body decay in a in a in a uh, in a casket, and and uh, and then uh, maybe think, well, maybe I should be cremated. But if I'm cremated, what about the resurrection? You know, I mean, uh, I didn't understand all those things, and it, it caused me some like worries over it. And, uh, <laughs> But but now we know it doesn't matter if your body is uh, like cremated and your ashes are thrown in the ocean and all the ashes are moved by the currents to all parts of the earth. God has the ability to take all the molecules from from your DNA, from right. your DNA. I'm sure He has that in His uh, storage bank of uh, knowledge about us, and He takes that DNA and He restores all those molecules to make us who we were, but without without the inheritance that we got in the first birth that was the uh, the birth defect of the sin nature. It's, fu it's funny you say that because a lot of people have those thoughts and had a lot of those hang-ups thinking, well, yeah, if I come apart and there's all these pieces, and, you know, and it, it, to the point where they tell people, well, no, it's wrong if you get cremated because then God, I've actually heard that people see, oh, God won't be able to put you back together and <laughs> I said, wow, you guys really have this limited idea of God. It's terrible. It's like, where, why would you think he couldn't do that? God made this, the universe from nothing. Okay, how, how do you think he would not be able to find the pieces of you and put you back together is beyond my understanding. But at the same time, too, you know, when you think about, like he mentioned, the nebula and going to see these places you questioned about, you know, I think it really destroys this idea that people have about a boring heaven. You know, I mean, when you consider the... First off, let's just forget the rest of the universe. Let's just talk about the new earth. The, it'll be like discovering a whole new home. It'll be, it'll be the same place and yet different to us in such a way where rediscovering the earth, I think, is going to be an adventure in itself, is going to be seeing all those places that you knew one way that are, that are so different and so much more splendid now. And then that combined with the trillions upon trillions of places that are outside, how could you ever get bored? How would that actually, how would that ever be boring? You'd never be bored. I, I think that uh, the, the word boredom uh, is a word that will never be used in eternity. Because no, I agree. <laughs> I, I just don't think it's, it's going to even be a concept that exists 
in our eternal existence because our lives are just be just constant uh, excitement and thrill and uh, learning. Learning is uh, for me even now in this this state. Uh, you know, uh, even though I'm I'm born again, I still have this the, all this limitations, and, and I know that uh, um, the way I even with my present abilities, I can understand that the. Uh, uh, I forgot what I was going to say there, what I was leading to about my limitations. Mm. Do you remember what I said at the beginning of that? <laughs> well, this is, this no, it's excited about point. you. Oh, I'm excited boredom. about you. Yeah, the, board, the boredom. This is only right, right, right. I just proved the, the <laughs> mental and physical limitations I've got. Even with these, these uh, you know, limitations I have with my brain and my body, uh, I know now that uh, the, the desire to learn, the thrill of learning is so much fun. It's, I find it so exciting that when my mind is perfected and, and I'm able to learn forever, what could be more exciting than continuing to learn? And when we understand creation, and, and it, 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 even as limited we understand it right now, as far right. as the vastness of the universe and then the vastness of inner space within a, within every molecule, uh, there is so much. And Einstein said we don't know even one percent of nothing. So right. there is so much to learn that forever and ever and ever and ever, I'm going to have the excitement of learning something and being in awe. Yeah. I, th I think it's one of the great things that we deal with as humans. It's why God rewards us with knowledge. Is that you know, to ponder something and ponder something and to finally understand it after a long time. I know I've experienced this lots, and I'm sure you have too in your Christian walk. It's you you go through things, things you're stuck on, things you don't quite understand, and then you get this revelation that God gives you, and you suddenly it just clicks. And it's some of those moments or some of the most joyous moments in my life where I'm like, Thank you, Lord, thank you so much for for giving me the answer to that question. For the longest time I haven't had an answer to that question and you gave me an answer to that question. And it's a very rewarding just just in that small way, you know, just in your walk in life, it's so rewarding to have that. And I can only imagine the rewards of knowledge to learn all the things that we thought we'd never get to experience or never get to see. I, I think it's going to be an amazing time. It's going to be, I mean, I, and I think that goes without saying that that's a that's a, a you know a, 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 I guess a dumb statement to make because of course yeah. it's going to be an amazing time. <laughs> if, if we go back to the very first episode on heaven, we were talking about the fact that so many people think, oh, I don't even know if I want to go to heaven. It seems like it'd be boring. <laughs> well, I I hope under people are beginning to understand now that right. you don't need to be worried about being bored in eternity. It's yeah. just going to be nothing but thrilling. He says, will the new planets be mere ornaments, or does God intend for us to reach them one day? Even under the curse, we've been able to explore the moon, and we have the technology to land on Mars. What will we be able to accomplish for God's glory when we have resurrected minds, unlimited resources, complete scientific cooperation, and no more death? Will the far edges of our galaxy be within reach? And what about other galaxies, uh, which are plentiful as blades of grass in a meadow? I imagine we will expand the borders of righteous mankind's Christ-centered dominion, not as conquerors who seize what belongs to others, but as faithful stewards who will occupy and manage the full extent of God's physical creation. That's kind of what I was trying to say when I was stumbling for words a minute ago. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's funny how we we often do that with his book. You know, we'll have an idea and and voice it, and then he'll come right along us right after us and say exactly what we were just talking about. It's so funny. It shows how we're on the same wavelength here. But yeah. but you know, when you talk about that, you know, you look at all the work. It's like God teaches us also the futility of trying to be more that we are at the same time. You know, look at all the work man has put towards space travel. And the farthest we've really gotten for man has been the moon. I mean, we haven't gotten beyond that, you know? And that's not even coming close to the surface in order to scratch it. I mean, we simply have gone nowhere. Um, it would take literally lifetimes, and you'd have to really forfeit your life to even go to the next planet in our solar system, which is nothing in the scope of the entirety of the universe. Now, while these things that we've accomplished are amazing feats, and, and they show man's ingenuity, and they show 
when he cooperates what he can achieve, it still really still shows you how small you are and and what you would need in order to be able to explore the vastness of space. We just simply don't have it. But we are going to have that leader. God is going to give us that ability. He's going to give us the bodies that can withstand it. The the fact that time won't affect us in the ways it does anymore. The the fact that you know distances in space and time won't matter anymore. It won't it won't be an issue. So that we can explore these things and we can go out to these places and we can see all these wonderful things God's created that we haven't seen yet. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the. Man thinks uh, that we've accomplished so much by being able to go to the moon, for example, and that's on a smaller scale, that's no more significant than let's say you lived in your house, the house you were born in, you lived there your whole life, and one day you actually were knocked on your neighbor's door and saw your neighbor for the first time, but you haven't seen anybody else or any place else the whole, on the whole earth, but just your one neighbor's door. That's kind of the perspective of the fact that... Right. That's yeah. exactly right. Exactly right. So it's and, and these were don't get me wrong. We're we're not selling short the all the work and the ingenuity and and the, and the knowledge and the imagination it took to accomplish these things. But at the same time, you also have to recognize on a scale, it's really so small. I mean, you've really not even come to the surface in order to scratch it yet. <laughs> mm -hmm. His next question is, what is the morning star? Hmm. That's interesting because I mean I I can't really answer that question off the top of my head. I mean I would I could give a, uh, uh, I I believe that Jesus has been called the morning star. I think that Lucifer has been called the morning star too. But let's see what he says. Jesus says of the overcomer, quote I will also give him the morning star. That's Revelation two twenty eight. The morning star is a celestial object the planet Venus. Although most people consider Jesus' statement to be figurative, um, it could suggest that God might entrust to his children planets or stars within uh, with their respective planetary systems in the new heavens. If the new creation is indeed a resurrected version of the old, then there will be a new Venus after all. I didn't know Venus was referred to as the morning star. I, I did not know that either. Mm -hmm. hmm. Well, you know, we got the North Star. I'm sure a lot of stars are, have these different uh, monikers. Uh, so Venus is also known as the morning star. Currently, Venus is a most inhospitable planet. Humans could never survive its incredible heat and corrosive atmosphere. However, it's possible that indestructible resurrected bodies could endure its atmosphere. It's also possible that when g the curse is lifted, Venus may become a beautiful paradise. We know God will put one uh, world under his children's authority, Earth. If the rest of the planets and the entire universe fell with and mm -hmm. will rise with mankind, I can easily envision our inhabiting and governing other resurrected planets. Uh, it really is, a, a, when you think of how vast creation is, I mean, probably every person has wondered, well, why is it the universe is so big, the earth is, is like equivalent to, if you take all the beaches of the earth, all the gran grains of sand, the earth is like a single grain of sand within this universe. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, so why, why, why uh, is God creating this vast creation and yet, just this one grain of sand is all that is, uh, you know, he wants uh, um, inhabited, explored, understood. And uh, it, I think everybody's wondered about that. There, isn't there a greater purpose? Why would he create so much it, just to have it there and for nothing? I, I know a few things that really mesmerize people as much as something like stargazing and, and contemplating you know, you know, on a dark night when you can actually see the Milky Way in some places, it's so dark when you're away from the city in the, in the darkest areas and you can actually see the Milky Way. I don't know of anybody that doesn't look at, that looks at that and says, eh, you know, I, I, nobody does that. I mean, they look at that and there's this natural pull that human beings have. And it's, it's gone back to the days of when men first started trying to circumnavigate the globe and were using the stars to get around. I mean, it was, 
they, they looked out there and there was this this tug out there, you know, to, to say, you know, we want to go out there, we want to see more. There's so much, you know, that we that we haven't seen. And it's it's literally mesmerizing. I know I feel that way when I, I love to stargaze and I love to watch things in the heavens. And I mean it's it's just to me, more than looking at the the amazing things on the earth, looking out into space and seeing how immense it is and how huge it is, and seeing some of the images like that Hubble's bringing back, um, some of these high definition images of galaxies that are far in the distance and everything. To me, that's just I'm I'm blown away by that. I'm I'm so curious and so <laughs> I, I so want to know more about these places and and hope one day in eternity I can go to see these places. It's amazing. Yeah. Um... You know, I've lived in a, cities my whole life, and you know, cities, you have the city lights, and because of all the light, you look up at the sky, and it's hard to see the stars, because mm -hmm. you live in a bright city. But on some occasions in my life, when I've gone off into the country where there's no city lights, and then, then you really see how spectacular the stars are. And as impressive as they are to us, just in that uh, uh, setting, uh, when, now that we understand the vastness of the universe, <clears throat> man thinks we think we can actually measure the universe now. We know its size and dimensions, I guess. Uh, I, I'm not sure how correct man is in, in calculating all that or not, but, but we, we do understand that now more than we ever did before the vastness of it. And, and we use even things like uh, traveling, the, the speed of light, for a year, 186,000 miles per second, and traveling at that speed for a year, that's a light year, and then at tra if we could travel at that speed, it's, there's millions and millions of light years just to get from one like solar system to another, so the vastness of it is just mind-boggling. Yeah. And so obviously, the more we learn about it, the more mind-boggling in all we are, we should be over this creation. And the question is, is it there for no reason, or did is God created it and will recreate it, renew it, because there's a reason for it? Well, you made you made the real quick. Um, I wanted to add to that. You made the other uh, comparison earlier about looking not only outside but inside. You know, for the longest time, we thought cells were certain cells in our body were co were considered simple, and then we found out when we got the ability to look closer, they weren't so simple. In fact, they're very, very complex, and they're much more complex than we thought they were. I think that's the same thing with space. It's like one of those things, like the more you go out there, the more complex you're going to find it is, the more you're going to find you didn't know um, because of our restrictions and our, our inability to see these things. Yeah. Yeah. And the more we learn, the more we know, the more we realize that how little we know. How little we know. <laughs> And, and therefore, there will be no boredom because we'll continually be learning more and more about this creation. I'm excited about it. Absolutely. Uh, for those of us who love astronomy and for fantasy and science fiction fans, this has exciting implications. I believe the great nebula of Orion, which has drawn hearts, including mine, to worship through its expansive beauty and wonder will be refashioned as part of the new heavens. Will we see a new Saturn, new, new Jupiter, new uh, Ganymede, new Pleiades, and a new Milky Way? I, I don't know if I pronounced all that correctly. You did I, pretty good. <laughs> I, I think that's the logical conclusion based on what scripture reveals. In the same way, that the new earth will be refashioned and still be a true earth with continuity to the old, the new cosmic heavens will likewise be the old but renewed. Yeah. It's just the idea of uh, it uh, in a resurrection, uh, it, it, it has to be us it, or you're, you're you're not resurrected. You know, if you if you were just destroyed, you didn't exist, and then uh, you were created again, but it was no not you. There's no memory, no 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 connection to the old you at all. There's no continuity in any way. Right. Then it wouldn't be you being resurrected. It's a, it's a different person. Right. And I he's I mean, he's making the same kind of uh, 
uh, statement about all of creation. All of creation will, will be uh, destroyed and then resurrected and there will be a continuity. So he's thinking that, well, you're going to still have the Milky Way galaxy. It's just not going to be a totally new universe. Well, I think, and I think that's where, there are certain lines in scripture I just love. They just stand out to me. And one of those lines is where <clears throat> the scripture talks about where it mentions, you know, once Christ resurrects, you know, oh, death, where is your sting? Because death for mankind was sort of the final word because of sin. And not just for mankind, but for everything in creation. Everything dies. And it, none of these things were meant to die. We weren't meant to die. God created these things to last. He doesn't make anything to die. Nothing he makes is for the express purpose of waste. It, he doesn't make it for that. He made it to exist forever. We brought death and we brought sin. And part of the victory over death is kind of God having the aha moment of saying, just when Satan thought he's won, and these things lie in ruins, and these things seem destroyed, it's like the picture of the dry bones rising up, or, or Christ resurrecting. Christ didn't leave his body behind in the tomb and then get a whole new body and leave his dead body. God took that body as if to say, no, death, you can't have this. You cannot have this. Yes. Like, and this is what he's saying to Satan. He's saying, you cannot have what I created. I'm taking it back. And it's as I made it, except now I'm going to even improve it. I'm going to make it better. I'm not only going to take what you have destroyed, but I'm going to make it better. Yes. That's his way of, of taking it, you know, taking it by the reins and saying, no, you will not have this. <clears throat> Amen. Um, Randy Alcorn says, um, in my novel Dominion, I try to depict this in a scene in which Jesus takes a woman who has died to a new world. He's quoting from his novel. Eventually they arrived on a world more beautiful than Danny uh, could fathom. Cascading waterfalls, rainbows of a hundred colors, mountain peaks five times higher than any on earth, oceans with blue-green water, and waves crashing upon the rock, rocks the size of mountains, grassy meadows, fields of multicolored flowers, colors she had never seen before. This place seemed somehow familiar to her, yet how could it, uh, yet how could it, since it was uh, like nothing she'd ever seen. Still, she felt profoundly at home. She asked, why hasn't anyone told me of this place until now? I think it would be the talk of heaven. The carpenter smiled at her and said, they did not tell you because they do not know of it. They've never been here. What do you mean? You are the first to visit this world. No, she said. Then her first face flushed. How could that be? This is yours. As your father once built you that tree house, I fashioned this place for you. Nancy beamed. He gave us our own worlds too, she said. Beautiful as this is, mine seems the perfect one for me. The master tells me each world he gives is a tailor made to the receiver. This is all for me? Yes, the carpenter said. Do you like it? Oh, I love it. And I haven't even begun to explore it. Thank you. Oh, thank you. She hugged him tight. He took delight in her delight. This is not the ultimate place I have prepared for you, my daughter, but it is a pleasant beginning, isn't it? Wow. It is a beautiful idea that we would actually get our own planet. Uh, of course, some people are going to start throwing uh, tomatoes at the screen now saying, are you Mormons? <laughs> wait, wait a minute. Well, just because somebody comes up with a similar idea in regards to the, the rest of creation doesn't mean we're subscribing to their theology. It doesn't, that's, we're not saying that. We're simply saying, I've mentioned several times, God doesn't make things to waste things. He makes things for his glory. He always. This is why God creates. It's why God made us. He does all things for his glory. 
Now, if he makes the rest of the planets and the solar systems and the, the rest of these galaxies, he created it for his glory, and he created it to be observed. Currently, we can't do that. I think it's logical to assume that one day we will observe these things. Will we be given worlds of our own? I don't know. <laughs> but is it wrong to say we absolutely won't? I think it's wrong to say that because we can't, we can't confirm either way if that's the case. Um, to imagine and think that might be the case... There's nothing wrong with that. I mean, it's, it's simply imagining based on how giving and how wonderful we think God is as a, as a father. He, he would, if God could do it, don't you think God would give the worlds to his, to his children? He would, give, he would give, I mean, didn't he give this to Adam and Eve? I mean, it's yeah. exactly what he gave them in the beginning, yeah. so why is it irrational to think that we should have something similar? Amen. That's a great point. Yeah. Uh, uh, otherwise... You, you have to wonder, well, why such a waste? Why this right. vast universe is <laughs> there being wasted? Well, there's got to be a purpose for it. But but where a Mormon would take this is a, to another level and say that we become our gods of right. our own planets and we have these uh, god powers of uh, that uh, uh, and and that's and that's what God was originally a man. They got his own planet, and this cycle goes on and on. And we will become a god of our own planet. That's where they err. Mm -hmm. uh, Randy Alcorn and I, I don't, neither you or I are uh, implying at all that uh, if we do receive planets or if we travel to planets that, that we're somehow uh, 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 become a god in the same in the same sense that Jesus is God or our Father is God. Um, God has built us, uh, built into us the longing to see the wonders of his far-flung creation. The popularity of science fiction reflects that longing. Visiting a Star Trek convention demonstrates how this, like anything else, can become a substitute religion. But the fervor points to a truth. We do possess a God-given longing to know a greater intelligence and to explore what lies beyond our horizons. In the Star Trek movie Generations, the character Guinan uh, tells Captain Picard about a place called the Nexus. She describes it this way, It was like being inside joy, as if joy was something tangible and you could wrap yourself up in it like a blanket. Wow. I think I used the same kind of words in earlier talks on heaven when I've talked about that we we're going to be basically in the presence of God and in eternity it'll be like being this constant state of joy and bliss. Whatever whatever bliss is. I mean, I've, I'm a very happy person. Uh, and and uh, some days I'm so happy I say that I'm giddy. But I've never reached a state of happiness that I would call bliss yet. But I expect my degree of happiness to be so much greater in eternity that it will be a state of bliss. And that that's how I see what they're saying here. That it's like being within joy. Like, let's say you're submerged, you're swimming underwater and you're submerged into the uh, underwater and but what this water was is actually just joy and bliss mm -hmm. that that's uh, I think that's what he's talking about here is that will be our state of existence mm -hmm. in uh, I mean who could be bored who could not want to be so anxious to 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 have that no, I think you make a good point. There's, we could never know in our current state true joy and bliss because bliss insinuates that you have absolutely no worries, and none of us have that. There's no human being in the world that doesn't have that. Um, even people with more money than they know what to do with. In fact, those people probably have a lot more worries than we do, um, which is why be careful what you wish for. You might just get it. Um, <laughs> You find that it's things are not always what they cracked up to be, um, and the simpler your life is, the simpler your life is. Um, and so, so I mean, I think that that's an important thing to think about. Um, and you have made that analogy. It's really kind of chilling, actually, because he's almost put it in such a way that I know you've described this before. It's it's almost like joy so intense you can literally feel the joy. I mean, it's like it's the only way I could describe it, and I think that's a very good way of describing it. 
Mm -hmm. Yeah. I'm still thinking about your the point you made about, well, why shouldn't he give us a planet? Didn't he give Adam and Eve a planet? <laughs> that is it. That is brilliant. <laughs> wow. Um, he goes on to say, I don't believe in the nexus, but I do believe in the new heavens and the new earth. What will the new heavens be like? Uh, like being inside joy, as if joy were something tangible and you could wrap yourself up in it like a blanket? Scottish novelist George MacDonald wrote to his dying daughter, I do live expecting great things in the life that is ripening for me and all mine, when we shall have all the universe for our own, and be good, merry, hopeful children in the great house of our Father. Then, darling, you and I and all will have grand liberty wherewith Christ makes free, opening his hand to send us out like white doves <laughs> to range the universe. What a beautiful thought. That is a That is a very beautiful uh, uh, passage there. That, that's great. Wow. I don't know. I hope people are, who are listening to us now are getting as excited as we are. Cause this, I hope so, too, because I really, every time we do this, I tell you, I can have a heck of a week, and this is a really nice way to finish it up, this discussion of heaven. I'm going to miss it when it's over. I know it's been about 20, 20 episodes now, but I'm really going to miss it at the end of the week. It's it's something that you just want to keep going with because it just it fills you with so much of that joy she, that she describes. Yeah. Well, I don't doubt that when we're through, I'll actually go back and watch it all in my spare time again on my own because I just want to constantly be reminded of this. I mean, uh, what what could be better for your attitude in, in this life than, I, than thinking about these, the promises uh, for, of our future? We have so much in this world to bring us down and make us feel depressed. It's nice to be able to go to something that builds you up, you know, and, and that's really what we're supposed to be doing. What has God made in the heights of distant galaxies, never seen by human eyes? One day we'll behold these, those wonders, soaking them in with open-mouthed awe. And if that won't be enough, we may see wonders God held back in his first creation, wonders that will cause us to marvel and drop to our knees in worship when we be held, when behold them in the new creation. Okay, now his next question is, will we live in a spatial world? The doctrine of resurrection is an emphatic statement that we will forever occupy space. We'll be phys physical human beings living in a physical universe. The resurrected Christ said, Touch me and see. A ghost does not have flesh and bones as you see I have. That's Luke chapter 24. He walked on earth. We will walk on earth. He occupied space. We will occupy space. We are finite physical creatures, and that means we must live in space and time. Where else could we live? Eden was in space and time, and the new earth will be in space and time. We will be delivered from all evil, but space isn't evil. It's good. God made it. It's Christoplatonism that tries to persuade us something is wrong with space and time. Uh, you know, we've talked about Christoplatonism numerous times uh, before, and if someone's watching this episode without the benefit of the others, that we should mention that the idea that uh, a lot of people have that. Uh, it, when we go to heaven, it can't be physical, because everything about the physical realm is is, is evil. That that uh, heaven has to be some ethereal, non-physical, otherworldly dimension where we're spirit beings without bodies. They think that's what it's got to be because the physical reality is is uh, evil. Uh, this idea has come from Platonism and Gnosticism. Right. Uh, and they brought this into Christianity, and this Randy Elko calls it Christoplatonism, bringing Platonism into Christianity. 
and it's uh, it's sad because that's that is kind of like the the norm. If you ask most people about heaven who haven't studied it like this, then they're going to think it is some non-physical, uh, non-spatial, no no time or space existence. Well, I mean, you know, it's funny, and I think uh, our brother Joe Byron has talked about this before because he mentioned this once before because he, he was trying to mention there will be space and time. And I, I agree with him. I think he's right. Um, there will be space and time. It simply won't affect us the way it does now because we'll be beyond the bonds of space and time. There will still be uh, – if there are going to be planets and solar systems and galaxies, there will still be – Moons and stars and planets going around. I mean, this is how we judge time anyway. We judge time by the rotations of these planets and the and the revolution of these planets around uh, their respective stars and their solar systems. So obviously, there's going to be time and there's going to be space if these things are still going to be in existence. I think the the, the hang up, the problem people have is. Again, we won't be restricted by the boundaries of space and time. We'll be beyond that. We'll be resurrected. We'll live in a, a creation that was built based on space and time, but we'll be beyond that into the fact that it, it, won't, um, it won't show us our mortality any longer because we won't be mortal. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You know, uh, when we do these shows here, um, the people participating, um, for the most part, I think most everybody has been younger than me. You're considerably younger. Some of our other friends that are on the panel here are quite a bit younger, and I feel like kind of like the old man. And uh, we, my wife and I, went to a, a party at some friend's house yesterday, and everybody there was 15 to 20 years older than us and you know I felt like I was like the kid <laughs> at the party and but the, the whole idea of thinking about aging and stuff is uh, you know when we think of time we think of it in a negative sense because we know that at some point our time runs out <laughs> you know exactly, exactly. We've, only got, we've only got so much time and then the time expires and we expire but thankfully you and I, we put our faith in our Savior Jesus, so He's given us eternal life, and there's going to come a time where time is—we don't have to fear time because we know our time will never run out. Mm -hmm. hmm. uh, one writer says of heaven, "It is certainly justifiable to abandon the scheme of time and space." And to put it in its place, a divine simultaneous simultaneity. Simultaneity. Simultane that's a hard word to say. <laughs> uh, this has a high-sounding resonance, but what does it mean? Uh, that we can be a thousand places at once, doing ten thousand different things. Those are the Creator's attributes, not the creatures. There's no evidence that we could be several places at once. The promise of heaven is not that we will become fine, become infinite. Uh, that would be to become inhuman. It's that we'll be far better finite humans than we have ever been. Even if we're unable, even if, I'm sorry, if we're even if we're able to move rapidly from one place to another or to pass our resurrected molecules through solid objects, as the risen Jesus did, we'll still be finite. Uh, as I said before, I'm not certain we'll have that power, though it is possible. Yeah. So in other words, uh, yeah, we're, we're going to uh, be uh, have this physical reality, a spatial existence, uh, but it, yeah, it is important to understand that only God is omnipresent. We don't, we will not have omnipresence. We'll be present in one location, and and uh, you know I'm sure we'll be traveling a lot on the earth and who knows where else. Uh, but uh, uh, <laughs> we'll be in one place at one time because we're not God. Well, I th I think the people who who think that you mentioned uh, Mormon beliefs, and there's some other beliefs that think that as far as being gods, I think when they contemplate the idea of being of us being gods they really sell God short because you know 
God is so far beyond our capability to understand. We, in order for us to be him or be like him, we'd have to know everything he knows, and that's not possible. And nowhere in scriptures that ever say we're going to have that capability. God, Because God always retains certain knowledge for himself. It says the things he reveals are for us, the things he doesn't reveal are for him, and for him to reveal in his time when he wants to. And when you consider every grain of sand that's all over the entire universe that God's aware of, we would never have that kind of knowledge. We would never have that kind of capability to know that. It's just so far beyond us. No, we would not be like God. Um, that's a Luciferian thing. That's something that, that um, Satan aspired to. Um, but I think, you know, in a way, I take comfort in that. <laughs> you know, I, and Mitch says that these similar things sometimes. But I take comfort in the fact that I won't know everything God knows. I'm not sure I want to know everything God knows. I don't think I don't want to know everything God knows. Um, uh, there's a lot that He's seen in human history. There's a lot that He's, you know, uh, a witness that I simply don't want to be, no, and I don't want to be aware of, and that's for him, and I trust that my father holds that knowledge for himself in the right way, and, and it's not meant for us. So I, I actually take comfort in the fact that he's behind the wheel, he's in control, and he's the one that's got all that knowledge, not me. <laughs> Amen. If we plan to get together with friends, the question is, where and when? Where is space? When is time? The three gates on the west side of the New Jerusalem are a minimum of 1,400 miles from the gates on the east side. If I wait for you at a gate on the west side, you won't see me if you show up at a gate on the east side. Even if the stated dimensions are figurative, the principle remains the same. When we walk outside the city gate, we won't remain inside. People, even resurrected people, can be in only one place at one time. There's no suggestion that even the resurrected Jesus was in two places at once. Um, he's using this, to, of course, to, to just prove this case that uh, that you know, in eternity, in the new heavens, new earth, we we. We will uh, have space and time. One author says, time and space will not be the same as known here on earth, and relationships will be of a different order. This being so, it is clear that the life of the new humanity and their resurrection bodies of glory can be described only in symbolic terms, unquote. That's what the Bible's biblical evidence for this claim. Um, but what's the biblical evidence for this claim? The biblical texts speak of time and space in the new earth, similarly to how they speak of them here and now. By reducing resurrected life to symbols, don't we undermine the meaning of humanity, earth, and resurrection? Hmm. Yeah, it's... Uh, yeah, it is amazing how people uh, want to. Uh, they they just can't. Uh, they cannot take so much of what we know is is literal as being literal. That there's time, there's space, there's physical bodies, there's a really earth, uh, and there's new heaven, a new earth, and it's it's an actual earth. You know, they just want to symbolize everything because they cannot. Uh, Accept the fact that, that that there is a physical reality in eternity. It's not some non-physical dimension. No. Jesus Jesus spoke of the uttermost parts uh, of far or farthest ends of heaven in Mark chapter thirteen. Even the intermediate heaven appears to occupy space. But certainly the new heavens and the new earth will. Resurrection doesn't eliminate space and time. It redeems them. He's also mentioned another term here that if someone's watching this video by itself without the context of all the other videos, they might not know what he means by the intermediate heaven. But you want to 
recap briefly what that intermediate heaven is, because right now we're focusing on sure. eternity, eternity, the new heavens and new earth. Right. The, the the intermediate heaven is sort of the holding place, the the heaven that exists right now that God dwells in with believers that die to go to be with him in the, at the present time. That heaven, we're told at the end of Revelation, is going to um, is going to come down to the earth. It's going that that kingdom, that city, God's holy city, is going to come down to earth, and then the two are going to become one in eternity. They're going to become one place, uh, exist in the same place in creation together. So, but right now, it's where they dwell with God the Father at the present time. Yes. Okay. Um, in the heavenly realms, even angels, whom we think of as disembodied spirits, can be hindered in space and time due to combat with fallen angels. That's Daniel chapter 10. Mm -hmm. In other words, they can be delayed from arriving at a particular destination in space. Hmm. You recall that part of Daniel? Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. People imagine uh, they're making heaven sound wondrous when they say there's no space and time there. If if it doesn't have space, it's not even a there. <laughs> oh, that's funny. <laughs> In fact, they make heaven sound utterly alien and unappealing. We don't want to live in a realm. In fact, it couldn't even be a realm. That's devoid of space and time uh, any more than a fish wants to live in a realm without water. If fish could think, try telling one, when you die, you'll go to, you'll go to fish heaven, and, and isn't this great? There will be no water. <laughs> <laughs> you won't have fins, and you won't swim, and you won't eat because you won't need f food. I'll bet you can't wait to get there. <laughs> After hearing our Christoplatonic statements about heaven, stripped of the meaning of resurrection, no wonder we and our children don't get excited about heaven. I was just going to say the same thing. How can you get about something excited about something that really is kind of meaningless? I mean, really, when when you when you, when you bring, I think people say you've mentioned this before. They mention these things either to sound deep or to sound pious, but really you're you're not saying something based on fact. You know, when you when you, when you go with this Christoplatonism uh, Gnostic view, it flies in the face. And I've brought this up many times, but I'll say it again to drive it home for the people listening. God created a physical universe and physical world to be lived in by physical beings. That's before the fall. To insinuate that that's bad insinuates that what God creates is bad. And that's just simply not true. If he didn't intend for that to be the way it was supposed to be, he wouldn't have created it that way to begin with. Yeah. So, I mean, I, I, it's a very big, easy way to look at it. And he also wouldn't have created it and said that it's good. <laughs> <laughs> I've mentioned that several times. God says he looks at this and it's very good. Nowhere does he say, oh, I created this. Wow, that's terrible. <laughs> Yeah. Sir Isaac Newton said of God, He is eternal and infinite, omnipotent and omniscient. That is, His duration reaches from eternity to eternity, His presence from infinity to infinity. Unquote. God is the one who inhabits eternity. That's Isaiah chapter 57. Creatures inhabit time. Jesus, as the God-man, inhabits both. By being with him on the new earth, we will share space and time with God. You know, I think there's a really important point to make in that statement you made mentioning about Sir Isaac Newton. You know, it's funny how we, how we, we call it progress, but it's not really progress. The further we move and the further we think we know and the more prideful we get, the further we move away from God. Scientists, it's, it's, it's a faddish thing for them today for scientists to disregard God entirely and to uh, not even speak about God having anything to do with the creation of the universe. But we find that the great pioneers, the great scientific pioneers who formed all the 
the theories and postulates and all these scientific formulas and all these things, these were all God-fearing men for the most point. Maybe not all of them, but most of them to some degree were believers in God and believer, believers that a greater intelligence than ours, that, that a God of the universe created all these things. I mean, these were these were men who established all the principles in science that we even have science for, and these were men that were smart enough to know that there was a God and that God created all this and put it into order. So I think it's important to mention that. Yes, Amen. You know, the uh, um, they, they they none of them were atheists. They believed in God at least in deity, mm -hmm. uh, if not a, right. a, a, in, 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 if not a theistic they were deistic at least that they believed that that uh, uh, this was not some accident that was in like uh, that some people think through um, uh, Darwinian evolution and natural selection this all became organized none of them thought that this was just some accident there that there was a deity or possibly even uh, uh, theistically that, that this there is a um, God that is a being that is a personal being and actually not only just created it, but, but wants to interact in, with his creation. Yeah, I mean, and, and that at its heart is a very uh, satanic um, uh, principle at its heart. And because what it does is it tells you all of the vastness of this creation, everything that's been put in place, no, it didn't have a purpose. There was no purpose behind it. Um, and God clearly has purpose in everything that he does. By saying there's no purpose, it steals the glory from what God has done and what God has put together because he does have purpose and he does have intent. And to insinuate that this has no purpose and it wasn't important, it was an accident, takes all the glory away from what God did. And that's all it's meant to do is steal his glory. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, will we experience time in heaven? Scripture says, with the Lord a day is like a thousand years, and a thousand years are like a day. That's Second Peter. Does this, does this mean there will be no time in heaven? The natural understanding of a new earth is that it would exist in space and time, with a future unfolding progressively, just as it does now. Yet people repeatedly say there will be no time in heaven. One theologian argues, what a relief and what joy to know that in heaven there will be no more time. Another writes, heaven will be a place where time will stand still. <laughs> where do such ideas come from? A misleading translation in the King James Version of the Bible says that, quote, there should be no, there should be time no longer, unquote, Revelation 10.6. This was the basis for theologians such as Abraham Kuyper Kup, uh, to conclude uh, there will be no time in heaven. But other versions correctly translate this phrase, quote, there will be no more delay. Uh, this, uh, which means not that time itself will cease, but that there is no time left before God's judgment is executed. That's interesting. Hmm. I hadn't looked at that verse closely it's enough to have in that way. Hmm. Well, yeah, I, I do think that is the verse that uh, people go to to argue that there will be no time. I don't think there's any other verse that I that comes to my mind that would that would support that. Uh, do you have that handy? Do you have it in, uh, in other translations to see it and see the context of it? No, I really I've only got the King James translation and the New King James translation. Um, I I don't know if I agree entirely with that. But um, I have to look further into that. We'd have to look at the context of that yeah, first. Yeah, right. I'd have to look at the context when it's written. And off the top of my head, I can't remember what the context was in that line. But I think really that could mean – that could be – again, you, also, you have to also deal, understand that when the – when John's writing this, he's trying to explain things that are very difficult for him to explain. 
He's trying to explain them in the best way he possibly can. Now, um, in fact, he's he's trying to describe the events happening in modern times. You know that we didn't know about that he didn't know. You know what was what these things were. He didn't know what helicopters were. He didn't know what 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 missiles were. He didn't know what you know. He didn't know what a lot of computers were. He doesn't know what all that those things are. So he's trying to explain these things in the best way he can. And so sometimes the way it's written may just it may have a meaning other than what we think it does. So it doesn't necessarily mean the line is wrong. It just means that was the best way for him to explain it. What it always meant to me was that time would not affect us any longer. It won't it won't affect us as it always has. Like I said, and we mentioned this before, time has always been the um, the indicator of our mortality. Time is what is what shows us our mortality. It's what shows that you know, eventually your time is up. And um, and in that regard, I think it's what it's talking about. But as far as that, I'd have to look into it further. I, I couldn't give you a really good opinion on it without looking at it further. Um, yeah, uh, I'm looking at it right now in the context, and the context does support what Randy's point is here. I think it really does. Uh, so when you get a chance, look at the context of where, where that voice that verse sure. appears. And I think it is correct. It's talking about a series of events, and then that uh, now that it, this is done, and there's no more delay. Okay. And there, and there, there's time no more. Uh, okay. Uh, other people are confused because they remember the phrase "time shall be no more" and think it's from the Bible. It, uh, it's actually from a hymn. Ironically, the same hymn speaks of when the morning breaks. Both. The words morning and when are references to time. That's interesting. Mm -hmm. huh. Yeah, that's amazing how... Uh, th there's another thing, the hymn that's uh, famous that uh, um, people... Th there's a great contradiction in that sometimes you'll see a pastor that, that uh, get up and preach right after the choir just saying the same hymn just as you are mm -hmm. and then he gets up and tells them repent of your sins for, you know get, <laughs> right. do all these things and then get saved and the hymns just got through saying no come just as you are you just know to try to repent of your sins and get yourself right right you you know, so Before you, come, you know, right, right, exactly. Some of these obvious contradictions, and right within this hymn, it, it, it's a contradiction. Um, the, the hymn says, "When the morning breaks." These are both references to time, morning, and when. And yet, the hymn also says, "Time shall be no more." <laughs> John Newton's hymn, "Amazing Grace," demonstrates a better grasp of time. When we've been there ten thousand years bright shining as the sun. We've no less days to sing God's praise than when we'd first begun. <laughs> that is, now that's a mind-boggling concept, isn't it? If you think about that whole idea that expressed in that hymn right there, that is what boggles my mind about time. There, there will be no less days there will never be no less yeah, days. It's the best way to say. How can I say it? Uh, it's a great way to say it. In fact, the song puts it beautifully. But it, it, it's a way to say, um, it'll be as if we haven't spent even a day. It, it, it'll it'll be because we've got so much further to look forward to. We've got all this time to look forward to. Past that, ten thousand years is nothing. It's it's yeah. it's it's just a small small time. Yeah, let me read it again because I can't sing. Otherwise, I'd sing it. <laughs> when we've been there ten thousand years, bright shining as the sun, we've no less days to sing God's praise than when we'd first begun. Mm -hmm. wow, that is. That's also another just exciting idea that uh, time's never going to run out again. I mean, I, you know, as I get older and older, I know my time's running out. Uh, I know that uh, I, I have received eternal life, and yet this mortal body's going to go into the grave, and I'll, be, I'll get resurrected. But I know my mortal body. There's, there's a finite amount of time it has. Right. And uh, unless we get the rapture. Well, yeah. exactly.
I'm and that I'd really that I'm hoping for. I I, I, ho- I hope we uh, hope the Raptor be- Rapture beat you out. I hope it. <laughs> <laughs> Because I'd uh, sure like to see all those brothers and sisters meet him in the in the air and, uh, yeah. and just to see the to see everybody's face when that's going on. Just to, that's that's going to be. And as as I get caught up and I see you being caught up right next to me, <laughs> I'm going to be like go, trying to get there first. <laughs> See, Eric, I'm getting there first. <laughs> but, you know, but you know the funny part is, remember what the Bible says too. So even those that pass first, they die in Christ. They're gonna, they're it's they're gonna start before we do. So we're gonna be there with all of them. We're gonna, you know, they're gonna be there too. So even if you do pass, you're still gonna take part in that. It's everybody's gonna take part in it. So nobody's gonna miss it. So. <laughs> uh, scripture contains many other evidences of time in heaven. Heaven's inhabitants track with events happening in time, right down to rejoicing the moment a sinner on earth repents. That's Luke chapter 15. Um, uh, and then uh, martyrs in heaven are told to wait a little longer when they ask how long before Christ will judge the inhabitants of the earth and avenge the martyr's blood. That's in Revelation chapter 6. Those in heaven couldn't ask how long or be told wait a little longer unless time passes in heaven. And he's got a lot of examples for this. I, I don't oh know. yeah, quite a few. He's got a, a lot. Yeah, there, there's. Uh, he's probably got uh, about a dozen different verses that make that same point. So there's really um, the the scripture does not say quote. Uh, you, you will continue. Time will continue to pass uh, in the new heavens and the and new earth. Uh, unquote. But from verses like that, it clearly shows that t- that we will there's be a, right. In, there's a recognized passage of time yeah. to the even in heaven. So uh, to, to so to de- to deny it to come to any other conclusion is just ignoring all these these scriptures. I I figure I think you'd have to ignore them. Mm-hmm. Now the next question is. Uh, is time bad or good? One writer maintains the end of the world is the end of time. Time will cease to exist. Time is a mark of the fallen state of the world. Unquote. But this could be true only if Adam and Eve existed outside of time, and they didn't. The sun rose and set in their perfect world. The sixth day of creation was followed by a day of rest. Time was not a mark of the world's fallen state. Mm-hmm. So to think that uh, you know time somehow, space or time is somehow bad or evil, is just it just doesn't make any sense how people could come to the, that kind of a conclusion. Well, I think it, it becomes negative to them. Time is not negative. It became negative to us because we found out that we were only going to live for a limited time. <laughs> so that's why people see it as negative. It's because life is lived for a limited time. Not because time is bad, but because we've had limitations now put on us. And again, that's recognized as one of the negative things. Not that time exists, but that we are now affected by the passage of time because we've only got so much time. Yeah, yeah. I think the point I made earlier is really, uh, I hadn't really thought about that before, but now that we're talking about time, you know, uh, and I'm forced to think about this, I really think that is the, the, the negative take on time is the fact that, you know, as mortal beings, we know that we have a certain amount of time, and then at a certain point we die, the time is expired. And so that, that way we have a negative take on, on time, and we know that, also, over time, uh, we get older, we get sick, parts wear out. You know, I've experienced a lot of that over the years where, you know, I'm not what I used to be. And uh, uh, so th- we, these are the negative aspects of time that we see. So that I can see how a man can, could look at time in a negative light beca- because over time, we, uh, you know, things rust, they corrode, our bodies fail, and, and then eventually... <laughs> It breaks down completely and it has to be thrown into the junk heap. But fortunately, Eric, you and I are going to get resurrected with uh, glorified eternal bodies. I can't wait. I'm telling you. Uh, let's go to chapter 27. Uh, it says, 
the question is, the title of the chapter is, Will the New Earth Have Sun, Moon, Oceans, and Weather? <laughs> uh, as we've seen, there will be direct continuity between this Earth and the New Earth. But the Bible includes some passages that have led people to believe that the New Earth will have no sun, no moon, and no seas. Will that be the case? If so, won't we miss those aspects of our current lives? Uh, I mean, there are some scriptures that we're going to go over that, that uh, you know, a person could think that's the case. Yes. Yeah. It is mentioned. There are some verses that seem to insinuate that. Um, but we may misunderstand them. Yeah. So. Okay. So now uh, the question is, will the New Earth have a sun and moon? People who think the New Earth won't have a sun and moon generally refer to three passages. Um, the city does not need the sun or the moon to shine on it, for the glory of God gives light, gives it light, and the Lamb is its lamp. That's Revelation 21:23. And then uh, Revelation 22:5 says there will be no more night. They will not need the light of a lamp or the light of the sun, for the Lord God will give them light. And then we've got uh, Isaiah 60, chapter 60, it says, The sun will no more be your light by day, nor will the brightness of the moon shine on you, for the Lord will be your everlasting light, and your God will be your glory. Your sun will never set again, and your moon will never will will wane no more. The Lord will be your everlasting light, and your days of sorrow will end. Then will all your people be righteous, and they will possess the land forever. Isaiah chapter sixty. So uh, I, we can see that you know if a person. Uh, uh, doesn't look at all of this in context and, and consider everything we've discussed up to this point. Uh, they they can take these verses and, and come to this conclusion. So let's see how Randy Randy's take on this. He says, notice that none of these verses actually say there will be no more sun or moon. Reread them carefully. Well, let's not reread them carefully, but it, they never none of them explicitly say there will be no more sun or moon. Right. They say you, uh, you won't need their light. You won't require their light anymore because God's going to be a source of light. Uh -huh. they, they won't exist anymore. It just said you won't need their light to shine on you by night and day because God's the light that he is going to place on the earth is going to create, in essence, it seems uh, to be an effect of it. It's almost like it's daytime, a brightness all the way, all, all on the earth all the time. <clears throat> Uh, that's what he says here. They say that the new Jerusalem will not need their light, for sun and moon will be outshone by God's glory. It's like I was talking about uh, looking at, up at the stars. I can't see the stars at night because the brightness of the city is outshining them, and they're, they're, they, they don't sh appear. But, but if I went off you know, uh, 50 miles outside of town, away from the city lights, then I could clearly see it. And so, in this case, God's glory is shining, and, uh, you know, therefore, we're, maybe we won't even recognize the light from the sun of right. the moon, because and God's his, glory is out shining it. Well, yeah, and if his glory shines as if the light of the day, think of the light of the day. In the light of the day, you can't see the stars either. They're all there. They're there. You just can't see them because the, the light of the sun blots out the, the light of the stars. It overwhelms them, and that's what his glory is going to do. Yeah. The third passage says that at the time when God's people will possess the land forever, the sun won't set and the moon won't wane, yet neither will dominate the sky because of God's brighter light. The emphasis isn't on the elimination of sun and moon, but on their being overshadowed by the greater light of God. Who needs a reading lamp when standing under the noonday sun? Who needs the sun when the light of God's presence pervades the city? The sun is local and limited. 
easily obscured by clouds. God's light is universal, all-pervading. Uh, nothing can obstruct it. God himself will be the light source for the new Jerusalem, restoring the original pattern that existed in Genesis 1 before the creation of sun and moon. Light preceded the light holders, the sun and moon, and apparently God's very being provided that light, Genesis 1-3. So, so it will be again, another example of how the last chapters of the Bible reestablish something from the first chapters. That was an interesting point, too. The last three chapters of Revelation and, and the first three chapters of Genesis are mirrors. And it is interesting. Uh, Isaiah tells us, quote, The Lord will be your everlasting light. Uh, but John f goes further saying, the Lamb is its lamp. John tells us in his gospel that Jesus is the true light that gives light to every man. And the light that shines in the darkness, but the darkness has not understood it. He records Christ's words, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. And John sees what Isaiah couldn't. The, the God who is the city's light is the Messiah himself. Isaiah, Isaiah says to God, Nations will come to, to your light and kings to the brightness of your dawn. The new Jerusalem will be a city illuminated not only by God's holiness, but also by his grace. Yeah. So, uh, uh, and there's nothing that says that we will not have a sun or a moon. It's no. just that the the light sources of it are not needed any longer. Right. Right. It will be as if they aren't there because the source of light will come from God, and it'll be as if we don't see them in their the way they are anymore. <clears throat> so, Randy's next question is: Will there be no more sunsets? Some people comment if the new Earth will be full of the light of God, does that mean we won't see any more sunrises and sunsets? Do you love sunrises and sunsets? Are you disappointed to think you might not see any again? Our sun is one of countless billions of suns. I think we'll see many more sunrises and sunsets on many worlds. And when we're watching one of those spectacular sunrises, I don't think we'll wonder, what am I missing? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, as spectacular as it is, you know, it is one of the most beautiful things that we can we ever see in our lives is a beautiful sunrise and sunset. I mean, yeah. what, what is, overshadows that as far as, you know, how spectacular it can be, and yet... I wonder what the sunrises and sunsets on, on other planets and other galaxies are like. I mean, when you just look, as you were talking about through that Hubble telescope and some of the things we're able to see in, in space now that are, you know, uh, you know, maybe tens of thousands of light years away from us, mm -hmm. and, and yet through the Hubble telescope we can see this, the, the, the beauty of it. Uh, there's one thing that I saw that's called the the eye of God. Have you ever seen that? Yeah, I have actually. It's pretty interesting. It's. It, I think it was a nebula, and it, it just it looks like it looks like a big eye. It looks. It's just pretty neat. Uh, it, it's interesting. Yeah, and how many things are like that uh, throughout the universe that you know, just be blown away, uh, and like sunsets and sunrises and other galaxies. Or, or you know, going a little sci-fi on you, but not necessarily sci-fi. You know, we call it sci-fi, but somewhere else it might not be. Um, imagine worlds that are maybe two or three times or a hundred times the size of the Earth with two suns that rise in the sunset or with three moons that are moving around somewhere closer to the I mean, we, we see 
a planet with one moon and one sun, and we have a sunset and and and, and moons. But what what about multiple moons and multiple suns? And I mean, it's pretty, you might you know I don't think we're, there's going to be any lack of amazing things to see at, at, in that time. Yeah. Uh, note that uh, the Revelation twenty two five passage quoted earlier says there will be no more night. Some people believe this is figurative, speaking of the nor the moral perfection of the new earth. Darkness is associated with crime, evil done under cover of night. Darkness is synonymous with distressed travelers unable to find their way. Prostitution, drunkenness, and idol worship often happen at night. In the modern era of electric lights, it's difficult to understand the utter dread of traveling in the dark and the threat of being locked out of the city gates that would close at night to prevent robbers, bands of marauders, or enemy soldiers from invading a city. To be outside the city at night was to be exceedingly vulnerable. This will no longer be. Um, yet darkness isn't evil. God created it before the fall. Night is also associated with positive things, Time with family after a hard day's work. Opportunity to talk, rest, have dinner with loved ones, read scripture, and pray. Um, it is it's true his first point about uh, darkness uh, being associated with you know bad things. Uh, you, for example, you know you know who comes out uh, at nighttime is the boogeyman. Right. <laughs> and. Uh, I used to I used to teach uh, martial arts classes and, and self defense classes and I would always teach people that uh, the the story about the boogeyman coming out at night it's a true story uh, the boogie the boogeyman does come out at night and you better be on guard for it and when I say the boogeyman I'm talking about just bad people evil people yeah. criminals right. uh, people like to use the cover of darkness to commit their crimes instead exactly. of doing it out in broad light broad daylight so at nighttime you have to be really afraid of of the bo the boogeyman the criminals right and and people people tend to associate the darkness with that the darkness itself is an evil it's simply the opportunity that unsavory characters use to take an opportunity on people that are unsuspecting in that case so it's it's not that the darkness itself is evil it's just somebody taking advantage of an opportunity that's all it is mm -hmm. <clears throat> Because God created the first celestial heavens to display his glory, that's Psalm 19, when he makes the new celestial heavens, they will perform this mission even better. That means we'll have to be able to see them. If that requires darkness, as it does now, then darkness we will have. If not on earth, then somewhere from which we can behold God's glory in the new heavens. I'm speculating, but I don't believe these passages demand constant and unvarying brightness, uh, certainly not outside the new Jerusalem. There may be diffused light or twilight without total darkness. Uh, light may be constant in the holy city, but not necessarily in the cities and countries outside the city gates. To view the, the new heavens, we might travel to the far side of the moon and other places where stargazing is unhindered by light and atmospheric distortion. Imagine the quality of telescopes that redeemed minds will design and build. We may be able to visit innumerable planets from which the wonders of the night can be viewed to the praise and glory of God. How will our eyes be able to tolerate the bright lights of the New Jerusalem. Our new bodies will be stronger than our present ones, will be designed for our highest purpose, to see God's face, brighter than the sun, without being blinded, rather than turn away from that light, will be drawn to it. I got a good I got a good question. Yeah. And there's a basis for this. Um, is it possible, maybe not, is it possible that we in our perfected forms uh, will emit light, that will give off some kind of light, or can give off some kind of light. Uh, in Scripture, um, heavenly beings of all types were, 
admitted light. The angels admitted light. Um, uh, visions of the uh, uh, visions of of the Lord uh, in, in different visions would admit light. So, um, is it po is that a possibility? Mm -hmm. I don't know. Well, uh, the uh, we know that uh, uh, there are some examples uh, of of uh, people who, who saw God and then like Moses his hair turned white and he glowed when he came down from the Mount Sinai. Mm -hmm. uh, so being in the presence of God, it gave him this aura. Mm -hmm. uh, I had something done many, many years ago. Uh, before I was a Christian, uh, there was a, uh, a person that did acupuncture and uh, various what they called holistic type medical treatments and stuff. Mm -hmm. And he, and he also did something what he was called Curlian photography. Um, and he would take a photograph uh, and, and you would actually you could actually see a, a, a aura around you. And it's, he, he used this aura to see spots in it where it wasn't right and determine what parts of your body were malfunctioning, you know. And I, I don't know uh, if there's any truth in it or, or what amount of truth there is in it, if any. Uh, but it was interesting how it, you, our body does have some kind of aura that is not visible to our naked eye, but through this type of photography, we can see a a something around our body. This, uh, and I don't think it it has anything to do with like. Our holiness, you know, like you know, a halo. People have halos. Oh, right. And, uh, depicted with halos because they're holy. But I, I think that it it may be the case that our body does have. I know we have electricity running through our bodies. I think I, I talked about I, that. I'm glad, I'm glad you mentioned that because in your last discussion, I watched the last video. I wasn't with you, and Austin kind of mentioned something. It was an interesting question about energy and how we are beings that we know get that give off energy. We are like a natural energy source of ourselves. Mm -hmm. Um. Perfected in our raptured bodies, our resurrected bodies, is it possible that we'll give off uh, greater energy? That there will be a maximum uh, 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 energy that will come from us that, uh, because of its perfected state and its new state? I mean, these are, of course, are purely speculative. I, I don't know what the answer to that question is. It's simply, it's simply something I figured I'd throw out there for you know discussion. You know, is it possible? Yeah. yeah. And I'm I'm probably one of the few people in the world who has actually experienced the electrical charge that exists within our body through that condition I had. That I had the brain surgery to fix, called uh, trigeminal neuralgia, mm -hmm. and, and um, the the shock that I would I felt was so severe that it was it was it made me realize my body is filled with a powerful amount of electricity. <laughs> Uh, and, that, and that's in its and that is in its limited state and it's in its yeah. you know fallen limited state. It kind of makes you wonder. Yeah. So maybe maybe we'll have even greater amount of electricity. Maybe we'll even be able to harness it somehow and use it. Uh, these are interesting questions, I think. Yeah. Um. So uh, the, let me see. Where was I? Uh, okay. Now the next question is: Will there be oceans? Uh, one of the confusing and to my, many people disappointing statements of scripture is that on the new earth there will be quote no longer any sea unquote that's Revelation 21 1 when we read that we think that there will be no uh, more warm inviting waters no more surfing tide pools snorkeling and fun on the beach and no more wonderful sea creatures well that's bad news but when scripture says, quote, there was no longer any sea, unquote, the core meaning is that there will be no more of the cold, treacherous waters that separate nations, uh, destroy ships, drown our loved ones. There will be no more creatures swallowing up seafarers and no more poison, poisoned uh, salt waters. That's good news. Uh, Steve Lawson elaborates, uh, quote, to the ancient peoples, the sea was frightful and fearsome, an awesome monster, a watery grave. They had no compass to guide them in the open sea 
On a cloudy day, their ships were absolutely lost without the stars or the sun to, to guide them. Their frail ships were at the mercy of tempestuous ocean, uh, ocean fear, oceans, fearsome, angry storms. The loss of human life in the sea was beyond calculation. So the sea represented a vast barrier for nations, continents, and uh, people groups. Hence, the prospect of no more sea was very positive for the passage uh, passage's original leaders. I mean, readers. Um, uh, I'm not. I'm not sure. I mean, I, Randy wants to find a, an explanation for this. Uh, he, 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 maybe he'll uh, give us a good reason to to think that that we shouldn't take that verse literally. That there'll be no more sea. Maybe we'll come to that point. I don't recall, but uh, I'm not. I'm not sure that that particular take on it is is uh, sufficient to make us uh, move me to that side. Yeah, I got to agree with you. I, I'm not wholly convinced of that. I'd, I'd have to. I'd have to look more into that. Yeah. Um, Lawson also wonders if there will no longer be seas because the seas, uh, as we know them, weren't God's original creation, but a result of His judgment through the flood. Quote: Many scientists who are Christians believe that before the great flood of Noah's day, there was no sea. But in the flood, the bottoms of the deep were opened up, allowing the release of great bodies of water, and the world was flooded. The oceans were uh, then formed between the overturned land masses, and the seas became a barrier separating what we now know to be continents, further dividing the human race. On the new earth, it appears there will be no sea because the earth will be restored to its original splendor. <laughs> Never heard that take on it either. I don't know. Uh, I think that one is more uh, logical than than uh, than trying to take the make the the sea into some metaphor of a, such a dangerous thing that people feared. You know. I'm not sure about that one. I don't know if I agree with those with those comments on that. I mean, I don't think that the Bible in, says that there was no sea. It doesn't say that. In fact, we know before um, before God began creation that the the earth was covered by water, so the darkness covered the face of the deep, insinuating the earth was covered with water. Um, so I would say water was there first. <laughs> um, it may be that. It may return to a time where the only thing you'll have will be, rather than there be what we understand as an ocean of salt water, it will the land will physically change on the earth to be more land, and these bodies of water will be taken up by um, clear lakes, streams, and rivers, and things of that nature. So we'll still have those kinds of things, but there won't be a, a vast salty ocean that will, like you said, separate the nations. Um, maybe that's the case. Maybe that's what's being said. Um, that that the the waters that will exist will be uh, rivers, streams, and uh, lakes that are clean and clear. And yeah. Uh, well, we'll finish. We're reading this part to see if he has some more uh, a compelling argument. Let's say hi to Brother Austin. He just joined us. Hey, Austin. Hey, Vlad. How are you guys doing? Well, hey. We're fan we're fantastic. We're we're trying to figure out uh, if there's going to be uh, any more seas, if the oceans are going to be non-existent uh, on the new earth right now. <laughs> oh, wonderful. I, I think there will be. I think there will be some water source, if anything. Yeah. Uh, yeah, the river. We talked about that last Sunday, the river in Jerusalem, correct? In new Jerusalem? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, could you turn your volume slightly higher, uh, Austin? Sure. Yeah, hang on. That's good. That sounded better. Great. Yeah. Uh, yeah, we're going to be finishing this up just in a couple of minutes, and then we'll have our after show uh, uh, talk here. Uh, let me just get through this final point here. It says, uh, uh, a case can be made that given the fallen state of nature, the salt seas function as a great antiseptic to cleanse the earth and make life possible here. The salt seas purge, cleanse, and preserve the earth. They absorb and cleanse the pollution and filth poured into them. 
on the new earth such cleansing will no longer be necessary hmm. um, then he, he says even if this passage means no more ocean this wouldn't require the absence of large bodies of water revelation tells us a great river flows right through the capital city how much more water will there be outside the city flowing rivers go somewhere we would expect lakes some of the world's lakes are huge sea like the new earth could have uh, even larger lakes especially if they have no oceans to flow into huge lakes could in effect be freshwater oceans hmm. Uh, one final point and then we'll finish this. Uh, another reason I believe the New Earth will have large bodies of water is that, as I argue in chapter 39, the same animals that inhabit our current planet will inhabit the New Earth. Most animal species live under water, not on land, and most of those live in the ocean. I would certainly, uh, it would certainly be no problem for God to refashion such creatures to live in fresh water. Uh, in a passage that definitely contains references to the new earth, portions of which are cited in Revelation 21 and 22, Isaiah 60 says of the renewed Jerusalem, the wealth of on the seas will be brought to you. To you the riches of the nations will come. The passage goes on to speak of inhabited islands and their ships traveling the sea. Surely the islands look to me in the lead uh, are in the lead are the ships of Tarshish, bringing your sons from afar with their silver and gold to the honor of the Lord your God. Somehow, the no more sea of Revelation 21 and the wealth of the seas and the great ships traveling from them in Isaiah 60 are are compatible. Well. well there's another idea there, which could mean it may mean that there will no longer be sea in the sense that we understand sea. I mean, wouldn't it be pretty awesome if all the water on the earth that, that met land was like the waters of the Bahamas or the Cayman Islands or the you know they all became these crystal clear bodies of water that were uh, inviting and uh, like you said, not treacherous but um, you know clear and uh, and beautiful and warm and inviting. So. Yeah. Well, there's a lot of different ideas he's presented on this. One, that the, the, the sea is associated with fear, uh, traveling across the seas without, uh, you know, compasses and, and uh, the treachery of the sea. Uh, so that's kind of a, 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 a taking it symbolically to mean trouble. Uh, and then they also got the idea that uh, uh, the seas w will have... Uh, uh, were needed because the, the salt, the salt in it to, to purify. Uh, but we're, it also says that we're going to have some seas uh, because these treasures will be brought in across the seas. So I'm not sure what to make of it at all. Uh, um, but he also he also gives the possibility that there's going to be these giant lakes that are as big as seas that uh, will be fresh water. So who knows how that's going to play out, but. So some, whether we're going to have seas anymore or not, uh, I really can't. I cannot uh, give a definitive conclusion on that. If I might say so, myself, Rafes, uh I believe that uh, we'll have a significant water source besides that great river because uh, I, I, I'm a believer that the animals will be there, and if we have the sea life, they have to live somewhere. So I think that they'll live in um, a pretty vast ocean is place or water source and then another source or, or another thing to point out is that uh, since God used the ocean to test our faith with um, Peter to walk on water I think that if it was used to you know to test our faith in some sense that I don't know why he would get rid of it now and it's not to say maybe the the water doesn't have salt in it anymore that might be a fair statement because it might be pure but I still think that there'll be some significant source of water based um, besides the great river mm-hmm 
Yeah, I mean, it, it would, some people would be really saddened to think of no more oceans, uh, but because they love the oceans, that this that's been their life, their life they've spent on the oceans in working on them and also in rec recreation in the oceans. Uh, for me, I, it, it's not a, a a great loss. I don't I don't like to go in the oceans. <laughs> So, right. I'm actually one of those other people. I, I would I would consider it a great loss to to lose the ocean. Um, if that's one of those places I'd love to explore. I've always loved the ocean and being out in the ocean. I mean, imagine being in the ocean, the crystal clear ocean, an ocean unlike anything you've seen, where you can see far greater than you ever could without the fear of something attacking you or without the fear of drowning, without the fear of getting lost at sea, you wouldn't have that anymore. Maybe they mean, mean the term sea here as a, um, a type of separation. Maybe they mean that there won't be separation because of the sea. There won't be, there will be unity because there won't be seas to separate you in that way. I, I don't know. It's uh, Again, we're speculating a lot, but... <clears throat> okay. Uh, let's cover one more question before we uh, close for the day, and then we'll pick up in a new chapter next time. And the question is, will there be seasons and varying weather? Uh, some people have never thought about heaven's weather because they don't think of heaven as a real place, certainly not on the new earth. Uh, or they assume the new earth will have bright sunshine, no clouds, no rain forever. <laughs> In a passage that promises rescue, security, and no more famine or fear for his people, God says, I will bless them and their places surrounding my hill. I will send down showers in season. Uh, there will be showers of blessing. Uh, the trees of the field will yield their fruit, and the ground will yield its crop. That's Ezekiel chapter 34. Uh, is rain a bad thing? No, it's good. We'll see trees bearing fruit on the new earth. Will they be rained on? Presumably. Will rain turn to snow in higher elevations? Why not? If there's snow, will people play in it, throw snowballs, sled down hillsides? Of course. Just as resurrected people will still have eyes, ears, and feet, a resurrected earth will have rain, snow, and wind. A lot of people, I mean, would would assume that this like this perfect weather all the time, and it's uh, there's no, uh, no there's no climate change, you know. Or I should use the word climate change now because that's no. Actually, you're using the term correctly. The people who use it un incorrectly are saying climate change. The climate yeah. does change. It's called seasons. Every year we have different seasons. Yeah. Um, and and you know it's funny. It's a matter of opinion to some people what's looked at as ideal weather and what's not. Some people love the snow. Some people love rain. I happen to I happen to like rain. I like rain. Um, but um, you know, it, you, I think you'll still get a variation of different things. Maybe we'll get things. Um, maybe we'll have things in ways that um, we don't have now. Like maybe we'll get all the seasons all the time in different ways. Like maybe trees will have different colored leaves on them all the time, all year round. Maybe, maybe um, I don't know, maybe something along those lines. Or in the, you want to go to beautiful places where there's snow, like like it said on the high elevations, you can go there, there's snow. You know, so. Yeah. Now, uh, I like to go, in Las Vegas, you know, we're in a valley surrounded by mountains. But in the wintertime, uh, a lot of the mountaintops have snow on them. And there's one area just, you know, maybe 30 minutes from my house, uh, uh, Mount Charleston Ski Resort and Lodge. And uh, I like to go up there not to ski, but just to, you know, be in the snow once a year and, and, and maybe some, slide down the hill a little bit and throw some snowballs and just to get in the snow. But I don't want to live in it, but I do like right. to go in and enjoy it a little bit. So it's nice to have it close by you know, if I want to go to it. Right. Uh, so uh, even though I wouldn't want to live in the snow, I don't like cold weather, I can still see how a lot of people would really love being in it because it's uh, it's it's beautiful. Uh, Snow-covered mountains are beautiful, and, and, there's, and you can have a lot of fun in the snow. Absolutely. Amen. I'll say the same thing about wind. Uh, uh, today in Las Vegas, it's windy. Uh, and uh, tomorrow it's supposed to be windy. Now I have some friends that don't will not go play golf if it's windy. As for me, I love to golf in the wind. First of all, a lot of people 
cancel their tea times and there's not many people out there so <laughs> it's not crowded another thing is the wind presents particular challenges in golf sure. uh, that are that are uh, interesting and I, I love to so to me a lot of people think of wind as a bad thing and and uh, you know uh, it, it, I'm not going to golf because it's windy but uh, to me I like it I actually I'm hoping for a windy day tomorrow because there are things I want to try tomorrow to golfing in the wind so uh, you're right these things uh, well, people's take on what is a good climate, good good weather, uh, you know, is it's not necessarily universally agreed upon. What's what's ideal? Right. The final point here is that uh, uh, he says, Randy says, I love the seasons, each of them, the crisp fall air, the brilliant yellows, oranges and reds, the long goodbye to summer, the snow blankets of winter, the freshness and erupting beauty of spring, the inviting warmth of summer, who uh, are all those from? God, who gives autumn and spring uh, rains in season. That's Jeremiah chapter 5. So will there still be seasons on the new earth? Why wouldn't there be? Some people argue that because fall and winter are about dying, we won't experience them in heaven because there will be no death there. I'm not convinced that seasons and their distinctive beauties are the result of the fall. God is depicted as the seasons uh, creator, and we're not told they didn't predate the fall in Genesis chapter 8. The quote, no more sin, I mean no more death quote of Revelation 21 applies to living creatures, people and animals, but not necessarily to all vegetation. Even if it does, God can certainly create a cycle of seasonable beauty apart from death. Okay, uh, what, what's your reaction to that before we close? No, I, I agree with everything we just said there. I, I think that no more death, uh, the, the, the big thing of that is... Um, that applies to animals and people. It, pl it applies to the things that weren't supposed to die. Um, there are certain things like eat, like we we know Adam and Eve. Eve um, ate fruits, and I'm sure vegetables and other things you know from the, from the garden. From, so it was they plucked things from their tree. <laughs> the things didn't stay there in a perfect state all the time. Maybe we'll have seasons where <laughs> the leaves change, but they don't fall off. Maybe we'll have um, you know. Remember, we're we're going to be dealing with a very uh, the, uh, the same earth and yet very different. So we don't know the kind of interesting things that are going to take place. You know, maybe we'll have all the beautiful things of the seasons. Like he mentions, you know, <clears throat> around the Christmas time, we have the blankets of snow, you know, without the treacherous things of the seasons. You know, we will, in, in uh, <clears throat> you know, in spring, we have some swings and sometimes you have tornadoes. Well, we won't have that, but we'll have the beautiful things of spring, the breezes, spring breezes, and and uh, things popping up in color and and uh, and, and spreading you know, flowers and things of that nature. So I think those are these are all beautiful things that we can clearly see the beauty and the majesty of God in these things. Why would God take those things away? It just doesn't make sense to me. Mm -hmm. Yeah. All right. Um, uh, next time we're going to skip ahead to chapter twenty nine, and we're going to ask answer the question: What will our bodies be like? Uh, the, the remaining uh, chapters we're going to be discussing in the study of heaven are really interesting. Like, what will our bodies be like? Uh, will, we, will we eat food? Uh, will we have our pets in heaven? Uh, what age will our bodies be? And so on. A lot of interesting questions like that. So um, I'm really looking forward to the remainder of this, this uh, study. Uh, uh, does anything stand out in your mind, uh, Brother Eric, and today that... Uh, you think this is important to repeat before we close? A lot of things. <laughs> um, so much material we actually covered tonight. Um, you know, going back and looking over the things about time especially, um, I think time is looked at in the wrong way. And I think people have a tendency to Everyone has a tendency to get tunnel vision on something they believe or think, and they 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 tend to. I see this. That's the way it is, and I just don't want to look outside this tunnel. Mm -hmm. Um, and I think we see again. We have to stop looking at time itself as a negative thing, 
because we're restricted by limits of time. That doesn't make time a negative thing. It makes sin a negative thing because it puts us in a condition that we were never meant to have, which was to be bound by the restrictions of only a limited time of life. We weren't supposed to have that. Mm -hmm. So that doesn't make time wrong. So the fact that the earth will still exist, the heavenly bodies will still exist, we gauge time by the movement of these heavenly bodies. If that's the case, then time most certainly will continue because those heavenly bodies will be there in the new universe, in the new heavens, and with the new earth. So, Yeah, yeah. Um, Austin, you, you, you missed uh, like 95% of the, the study, but uh, I'm going to ask you one question because I think this is – uh, Brother Eric had a great answer to this question, and I want to see how you respond to it. But okay. do you think that it's it's possible that uh, uh, God will will give you your own planet? Um. Yes. Okay. Um, and and Brother Eric's answer to that is why not? Because Eric. Oh, I said because he gave that to Adam and Eve, didn't he? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you gave Adam and Eve their own planet. So uh, what's what's? Why would we not think that maybe he, uh, out of all this universe, you know, this so vastness of it, that uh, maybe he's uh, making a planet just for for Brother Austin to have have someday too. Wow, that, that's that's this really cool thing about. Yeah. That, because we're not we're also known as stars, correct? All the saints. Some will shine brighter than the others, but won't we all be like stars? Uh, I'm not familiar with the, the the word star being associated with the saints. I know that the, the stars are associated with uh, uh, angels. Okay. Okay. But uh, that's okay, a pretty, that's a pretty intimidating thought to have your own planet. That's that's kind of intimidating. <laughs> yeah. Uh, when we talked about it during the during the show, though, we were careful to say that look, don't don't confuse this with Mormonism theology. Right, we're, not saying, right. we're not saying that if God gives you a planet, that all of a sudden you get to be a god. You're not going to be God. You're, you're, you're going to still be a child of God that uh, God uh, wants you to have a planet. To have, but uh, it doesn't mean that you become a God and, or that that our God, uh, all Father God and Jesus Christ, that uh, they were once men that became gods. That's that's the problem with Mormonism. That's They think that they can become a God and, and that every all, the God... To, that we worship was once a man who became a god. So that that's they go terribly wrong, horribly wrong when they take it to that point. Right. Um, now let's uh, let's close by telling people um, uh, if they're excited about heaven uh, and they're learning about it. Now they're saying, "Wow, this is really sounding a lot better than I thought." I mean, I thought heaven was going to be some really boring thing. I had no interest in it. Now you got me interested. I want to I want to go to heaven. Well. What what kind of people get to go to heaven? Well, you know, uh, Brother Austin, uh, is yeah. it is it people is it people who uh, uh, if they live a really good life and uh, and uh, change their life around and and uh, uh, become really religious and 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 uh, give a lot of money to charities and stuff are those people the want the people who get to go to heaven? Nope. It's not to say that those aren't. Uh, it's not to say that these are bad things to do. Uh, I wouldn't recommend being religious, but um, being a good person, I'm not. I wouldn't say is not a bad thing to do, but it's not um, a qualification to go to heaven. Mm -hmm. So, well, what what about the people that are uh, uh, really uh, really want to go to heaven and are working real hard to try to to achieve that, and and they 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 believe that if they are good enough. That uh, you know, God will approve them and give them uh, heaven. Well, I'd have to tell them it's it, it even though they might mean well that uh, we can't work for something that's already been paid for. And I would just explain to them that um, we have a receipt and we have a payment, and all we have to do is simply believe to get it. Uh, the receipt is that Jesus Christ died for everybody's sins, uh, even the whole world, uh, every single man woman and child that's ever been born, will be born, or ever was born, uh, because he died for the sins of the world because, John 3.16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whosoever believeth upon him should not perish but have everlasting life. Uh, he was buried to show that uh, he literally died, and then he rose again the third day to show he was God. He ascended into heaven and applied his blood on the mercy seat to take away the sins of the world away. That was what... Uh, 
we were bought with. We he did the act, he paid the price, and salvation now is offered to all by simply believing on the Lord Jesus Christ. That's all. That's all it's ever needed to be. That's mm -hmm. all it's all ever been to. It ever will be. By grace are you saved by faith. Amen. So uh, most people I've met in my life uh, are under the false impression that in order to go to heaven, uh, it's up to them to uh, achieve it through their own personal merit. But what you're saying is that that's not God's way to do it. Uh, God's way is by putting our, our faith in this Savior, Jesus Christ, instead of putting our faith in our own personal merit. Absolutely. Okay. Uh, and uh, the, what, what is this, Brother Eric, this idea of this, uh, uh, once we understand that this, who Jesus is and he, what he did for us, and, and uh, he wants to give us eternal life as a, as a gift, what does that mean to you when we, when we think of it in terms of a gift? Well, it's something that's free. It's not something that you can work for. It's not something that you can earn. It's not something that merit can gain you. A gift is something that is given to you by an, either another person yeah, from their grace, the fact that they chose to give this to you. It's free. There are no strings attached. There are no ties to it. Um, it's free and handed to you. And in the case of Jesus, it's it's done based purely on your trust. It is you saying, I trust you, Lord Jesus. I trust you and you alone to do the work for me, and I trust that you have done that work for me. And that gift is given to you freely. You, you do not owe anything. You do not have to pay on it. It's something that even when we give gifts to each other as brothers and sisters, we give freely with no strings attached, and that's what it's all about. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, so what I'm getting from you guys is that uh, um, trying to uh, re receive this eternal life in heaven uh, through our personal merit uh, cannot work. And, and we need to instead uh, come to Jesus Christ and, and, and put our faith in him, and then he in turn gives us uh, eternal life in heaven as a gift. Now, what happens, though, if someone receives this gift of eternal life and then they they decide that uh, they're going to go out and you know commit a big whopper of a sin tonight. Uh, let me just finish by saying I'll, I'll complete the verse that would sum up to help explain what we were, we're getting at. Ephesians 2, 8, 9 says, For grace you say by faith, we did, nobody deserved it, but we're simply saved by faith. For grace you say by faith, and that not of yourselves. Absolutely nothing we can do in salvation. Salvation is all of the Lord and nothing we did. For grace you say by faith, not, not of yourselves. It is a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. There's nothing we can do or boast or say that we did in order to receive this free gift, and to also say that it can it ever be can it ever be um, taken away? No, because if there's nothing we did to earn it, there's nothing we can do to lose it. And I will put on um, as I did want to say something about the snow. Uh, I do believe snow will be around, but also I have a great verse that I can tie in with all this. This is Isaiah uh, one chapter. Uh, Chapter 1, verse 18, it says, Come now and let us reason together, saith the Lord. Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though they be red like crimson, they shall be as wool. And once you simply believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, you know, you have that blood covering, it doesn't matter whatever sin you've ever committed, it's all been paid for. It's all been it's taken care of. There's nothing you can do to lose it. Every, every single sin that you'll ever commit, past, present, or future, that has to be emphasized, or future, was paid for. It's already done. It's once you have that, it's just simply to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. And once you have that faith, that one-time faith, that whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Once you have that faith, you can never lose it. Even if you fall in the way, even mm -hmm. if you change your mind, even if you start following something else, that one-time faith has ensured your um, eternity, has ensured your destiny to go to the kingdom of heaven when you die. Mm -hmm. The uh, it, it sounds to me what you're you're, you're uh, emphasizing um, uh, is that sin, This uh, man wants to try to work their way to God by becoming good and uh, getting control over their sin and, and saying, I'm not going to sin anymore and then God will accept me. But you're, what you're saying is sin is not the issue anymore. You're saying that all, all sin has already been paid for by Jesus. Uh, every sin that I did in the past, every sin that I might do in the future, 
Well, Jesus paid for all the sins, so now sin is not the issue. Most people think sin is the issue. They got to get control of their sin. But you're saying sin's not the issue, but the issue is the Son of God, Jesus Christ. What will you do with Jesus Christ? Will you put your faith in him completely, or are you going to try to get there apart from him on your own merit? Absolutely, just faith in Christ completely. And what I would say is that the world likes to use a word to tie this into their doctrine. They say we must repent of our sins. To repent currently in this, how it's always meant, is a change of mind. And it's a change of mind to know that you can't work for your salvation. There's nothing you can do to earn it. A change of mind is to not believe in yourself for salvation, but Jesus Christ and everything he paid for in full for salvation. Yes. Amen. Okay. Brother Eric, any final th uh, thought before we uh, say goodnight? No, I think Austin covered it beautifully. Okay. Uh, so uh, if you're watching this uh, and uh, you want to go to heaven, I hope you understand how to go to heaven now. Just uh, re reject the idea that you can somehow get to heaven based upon your personal merit. Uh, understand that you are undeserving. No one deserves eternal life in heaven, and that's why we need the Savior. The Savior is Jesus Christ. He's the only Savior. He is God Almighty. He wants to give you eternal life. If you put your faith completely in Him instead of yourself, He'll give it to you right now. And if you do that, please make a comment on this video. Let us know. We'd love to celebrate. So, th panelists, thank you for uh, participating. Uh, Bless you all in the name of our great Savior God, Jesus Christ.